Uh, tezolizumab has, has been approved, uh, Rob, and uh, your experience in treating patients with tezolizumab. You know, at, at a high level, I would say not terribly dissimilar from what we saw in trials, but there are patients who would never have gotten the trial. So I'm going to describe briefly a guy, and you've all seen somebody like this, who's a young guy, literally, when I say young guy, he was 38 years old with metastatic disease, nodal and bone metastases. Uh, when I saw him, he had a hemoglobin of five because he had a met that was bleeding into his colon. As it turns out, that was biopsy proven. Um, he got tuned up a little bit, came back, hemoglobin of seven, but was in a wheelchair. Um, performance status was sort of 2.4-ish, kind of. Um, he had received platinum-based, carboplatin-based chemotherapy by uh, his oncologist before he progressed with all these issues. Following two doses of atezolizumab, he walked into clinic. His hemoglobin was 12. He's now been on therapy. He's about 18 cycles out, working, hunting, doing all the things, gained 55 pounds back. So th we would never have, this was a guy who we would have given maybe, well, actually, I would have probably referred him to hospice and symptomatic supportive care. That's what, to me, is, the, and I don't think it's that unusual. This is sort of the poster child. So to me, having these drugs is a paradigm shift. And granted, it's only 20, 25% of patients. Most of our folks don't respond. We all, we're going to talk more as the program goes along about how to make that number bigger, right? I mean, hopefully the point that Betsy made about maybe we're, tr we're getting responses from the same group, well, but perhaps by using different therapies or, or adding them together, we expand the group. But this is the promise of the immunomodular ther therapy in bladder cancer. And to me, that's... That's what the community use. Using these therapies now in the real world, frankly, has been encouraging because I see people respond who would never get on the trial. And I think the impressive thing is the durability. I mean, I think we've Absolutely. mentioned the durability. And in fact, we updated our, our phase one experience mm -hmm. uh, at, at this meeting. And one of our patients lived has now 39 months out since the original treatment. He had had two prior chemotherapies. And in fact, you know, if you respond, you're going to generally respond for a fairly long period of time. The median duration of response in the phase one trial, as well as the phase two trial, has not yet been reached. So, uh, so it's, it, the responses you know, are different. Emphasizing that, I mean, again, we all know this because we lived this life, but the older panel <laughs> members who are on this side of the table, <laughs> the fact is, is that other than the node positive patients who could, you could give cisplatin to the you do see, and all of us have a few of those patients, or maybe more than a few, but the reality is it's a tiny fraction. Nobody else, nobody else does that right. with the drugs that exactly. we have. So th this is a striking difference yeah. exactly. in how we take care of people. Exactly. We, we can state unequivocally we never saw this before immunotherapy. In second line. In, in second, second line yeah. therapy. Yeah. You know, yeah. And, and I, I have a patient, one of the first patients on a Tezo, um, and actually is in CR, actually progressed right through chemotherapy with disease and bone. Um, is a CR, CR out now, uh, one of the first patients on that, on that trial, went out, bought a new boat, and named it Miracle. And so I think there's a message there. So. <laughs> Well, that's uh, that's we certainly great. We, we need we need more of them, and that's that's what our goal is: is to try and improve these treatments and and make immune therapy more applicable to all patients, rather than having a quarter of the patients at least 50 percent moving forward. So, uh, we are developing new agents for this disease, and, in, and recently, nivolumab was approved for uh, the treatment uh, of second line urothelial carcinoma. So, Betsy, could you go over the Checkpoint sure. 275 trial? Yeah, sure. So we participated in this trial. So this is another single arm study. I think the hallmark of the study, it's an awful lot of patients. It's a high number of patients, 270 um, patients on this trial. And, um, I, you know, I think it is a different agent, but it's not necessarily a new paradigm. I mean, these were all checkpoint inhibitors. I think they all interfere with the same pathway. And I think it shouldn't be a surprise that we see some consistency of data across these data sets. So the, you know, duration of response, again, not reached, speaking to durability, 20% overall response rate. That's, like, exactly where we're sort of hitting with all of the checkpoint inhibitors in this second-line space. Um, and it's not a surprise that it was approved because it does just as well as the others. Uh, this one is in every two-week dosing schedule, and I think the dosing may evolve for nivolumab across the program over time, so we'll have to watch for that. So that's one way that it stands out. Um, the rate of adverse events was numerically maybe a little bit higher on this one, but I think, again, without randomization, certainly without randomization to chemotherapy or head-to-head -head comparison, it's hard to draw correlations there. So another tool, exactly. how it's different, I'm not sure. 
Well, exactly. And it, it shows, you know, the differences also could be attributed to the heterogeneity of the disease. So it's very, as you point out, it's extremely difficult to compare one agent to the other in this particular setting. And probably there'll never be a randomized trial that, that answers that particular question. So 